All right, let's begin with a moment of silence, settling in together. We'll start by just settling into our bodies. So noticing whatever um, physical sensations happen to be passing through at the moment. Maybe in your stomach, the feeling of your weight on your bottom. And of course, the ongoing process of breathing, but not just saying I am breathing, actually feeling moment by moment directly the sensations. And then bringing our awareness to our hearts, which most societies believe is where the mind actually resides, not the <clears throat> thought managing machine that is the brain, but the mind itself consciousness in the heart. And then through our hearts, we can feel the whole uh, ocean of awareness that is the source of all creation. And there's a warmth to this awareness, the immediacy of its feeling all of the waves that it loves to create and that it loves. And so we are waves made of that ocean, all of us here together tonight. And so we join in an intention to further our ability to work on behalf of all our fellow waves the two purposes of Buddhism, enlightenment for self and others. And this naturally grows from our feeling, our true connection with all of our fellow waves on the ocean. And in this way, we can feel our true connection to each other beyond the electronic one. There's a real one. And so we feel that together. All right. So when I heard that um, tonight the theme was going to be bodhicitta, I thought um, that's a big subject. <laughs> Can we narrow this down at all? <laughs> and um, Rachel was kind enough to send me, uh, but I asked uh, for, um, you know, what are themes from the students? And so um, she did a very organized uh, list of bullet points. Um, which happens to be a, a nice pro progression, which I'm mostly going to follow. <laughs> um, so the first question, which um, some of you know, and some of you may not know, is what is bodhicitta anyway? And um, bodhicitta uh, literally translated means heart mind of enlightenment or awakening. Um, so bodhi uh, is the same, comes from the same Sanskrit root as Buddha, bodhi, Buddha. Um, and so Buddha means one who's awake. 
Um, so kind of interesting uh, to think heart mind of awakening. And obviously this is crucial to all branches of Buddhism. It's especially important to um, Vajrayana, but we'll get into that uh, in just a bit. First, I wanted to talk a little bit more about more like the feel of uh, kind of to give you a feel for bodhicitta. So uh, in the opening, I talked about the ocean and waves. And I think we um, really all of us human beings can kind of relate to that metaphor. And sometimes metaphor is better um, than more of like descriptive sentences. Um, sometimes poetry is more accurate than descriptive sentences too. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to be doing a little bit of both. Um, so talking a little more about that ocean, um, it, it's an interesting thing about ocean and waves. We talk about them as separate things, but of course they're not really, right? But um, in everyday life, we've gotten in the habit of seeing ourselves uh, really just as these waves, and we don't see the ocean part uh, underneath that's giving rise to us and all other waves, any anything in creation, anyone and anything. Um, and of course, what else would we be made of but that source, right? And what are waves made of but ocean? Um, so kind of important not to lose sight of, right? <laughs> and yet we do. Um, and, uh, sometimes people, uh, fall in the other direction and they think, oh, you know, there are no waves. It's just ocean. And that's not right either. You know? So, um, this gets into, um, ultimate and relative truth as they're called the two truths. And, um, so bodhicitta, uh, can be felt and experienced on both of those levels, sort of the uh, the ocean part and the wave part. Really, um, we can't sacrifice one for the other, right? So uh, if we fall too much in the wave direction, then uh, we're gonna be living life as though it's me against all the other waves. And you know that's gonna really make a big mess. All we have to do is read the news to discover what happens when you do that. Um, but if you fall in the other direction, um, you know, and just say, well, you know, nothing really exists except the depths of the ocean, uh, you know, and this is all an illusion, this kind of thing. Well, that's falling in the other direction. Um, so it's kind of like, um, this one friend of mine who is a Zen nun, she was in retreat, um, and she came for her like interview, I guess once a day she would come for an interview and she had had really this wonderful experience. And she said, oh, I can really see how, you know, all of this is just an illusion. It doesn't exist at all. And he said, really? Well, what about this? And he grabbed and pinched her nose really hard. And she was like, ow, <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> Yeah, so it's the two truths, and we need to honor and respect both. You know, we're in both um, aspects of reality, and it is possible to go into what uh, physicists call a superposition, where we're really holding all of it in our minds. And we can't do that just by studying or listening to people talk, like me. Um, it requires meditation so that you can actually be in the experience yourself and experience it for yourself because it's really beyond words. Uh, shortly after the Buddha reached enlightenment, uh, this small group of students was with him and they were saying, tell us, what is it like? And he fell silent. Uh, because of course, any concepts were going to make it smaller and different from what it actually was. <clears throat> Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm giving you images and so on, so you can get a feel for the um, two kinds of bodhicitta. So there's uh, uh, absolute and uh, relative bodhicitta as well. So in the absolute, 
uh, we can feel um, the pure love uh, and compassion and so on of the great ocean that is the source of all of us. Because of course, it's given birth to all of us. It's as immediate as everything we're made of. Um, so um, how can it get more intimate than that? So then um, it's ultimate love, ultimate compassion and joy and so on. <clears throat> um, so I, I feel like I want to share this quote with you. I've been reading Ram Dass's autobiography that recently came out. Uh, he had a long life, so the book is 400 and some pages, it's really, I think, at least. Yeah. Um, toward the end, when he's really talking from this vast superposition um, perception of reality, uh, and he was just kind of living in it. Um, he wrote this, to be here now in this vastness, I have to let go of the desires and expectations that keep me time bound. This is the essential surrender of the bhakti path. So bhakti is um, the path of love and devotion. Bhakti is a Sanskrit word. Letting go allows the self of everyday experience, my ego, my thinking mind, to merge with my higher self, my true nature, to merge with the beloved, capital B. I have to let go of my experiences, of even being an experiencer. That is how this jumble of my thoughts and sensations and emotions is forged into one in the fire of love. The 19th century Indian saint Ramakrishna likened himself to a salt doll melting into the vast ocean. That ocean is pure consciousness and love. So uh, I hope that gives you a little bit of a flavor of what bodhicitta is and those two forms of bodhicitta. <clears throat> there are two more, but we'll get to that. Buddhist math. There are two thises and two thats, and then we're going to discuss the four something else. Um, but anyway, um, someone asked, um, how does bodhicitta fit into the Vajrayana path? And um, I would say it's an intrinsic part of it. So there are three basic branches of Buddhism. There's Theravada, which was the first uh, turning of the wheel by the Buddha. And then there was Mahayana. Um, the second turning. And um, in Mahayana, bodhicitta is absolutely essential. Compassion is absolutely essential as uh, an expression of bodhicitta. So um, how would I say this? Um, it's like, uh, well, that's when we get to the two truths. It isn't just enlightenment for myself. You know, I just am fed up with samsara, I'm getting out of here. And that was kind of where the Buddha started with his journey. Um, but um, he was also a bodhisattva. And so he was also thinking about everybody else. It's like, I'm not going to uh, get the heck out of here and leave everybody else to suffer. Everybody suffers from birth, old age, sickness, death, um, not getting what we want, getting what we don't want, all of those things all the time, and chasing and chasing after what we want and ending up with a lot of what we don't want. So um, he didn't want that for everybody. And so his motivation was enlightenment for self and others. And that's very much the Mahayana path. And because Vajrayana is a subcategory of Mahayana, it's also absolutely um, essential to the Vajrayana path. Um, so then the natural next question, and Rachel, thank you for this progression because it's perfect. <laughs> um, how do we practice? Uh, no, sorry. Uh, so I've discussed uh, what are ultimate and relative bodhicitta. So next question, how do we practice both aspirational and engaged bodhicitta? So I told you there was two something else's and here we are. Um, so, um, 
we need to be able to train ourselves in things like loving kindness and compassion. You may think um, that love is just an emotion that we feel, just, you know, um, a sentiment, and likewise with compassion. But actually, um, there are capacities that we already have that we can grow. And these practices, um, four of which I will talk about later, more Buddhist math, um, help us to train in four different avenues, if you will, of feeling how we're not separate, feeling ourselves connected uh, through loving kindness, compassion, um, sympathetic joy, and equanimity um, with all beings, our fellow waves in the ocean. Um, and the more we practice that, the more we find when we're off the cushion and we're in a challenging situation, we actually um, are able to feel those emotions and they can help us to uh, respond in different ways from our knee-jerk, typical, habitual reactions. Um, and the other thing that happens as we train in aspirational bodhicitta is that naturally when we get up off the cushion, now we want to do engaged bodhicitta. We want to actually uh, help people to feel better. And so the that's then, you know, an expression of relative bodhicitta. Both aspirational and engaged are more uh, expressions of uh, relative as opposed to absolute bodhicitta. So um, that's how those relate to each other, just to say it quickly. Um, but so, you know, there are lots of ways to um, engage our bodhicitta and actually manifest it with our fellow waves, our fellow beings. Um, but I want to stop and first just um, call your attention to the fact that you already have these capacities. So for example, um, if you're walking down the street and you see um, a puppy that's obviously without a home or a mother, I mean, your heart goes out to that puppy, right? And um, you want to take that suffering away and replace it with happiness. That's just a natural response. Um, why would that happen? Why would we feel that if we weren't actually connected in the way that I've been describing? I don't see why that would happen. And then let's say, you know, you're watching this and, you know, just sort of feeling an aching in your heart. And then you notice somebody deciding to scoop up that puppy and deciding to adopt that puppy. And it starts to kiss the, the new mom, let's say, and the mom is all, oh, you know, this feels so good. I mean, how do we feel when we see that? How do we help but feeling, you know, sympathetic joy? That's sympathetic joy right there. Um, and the compassion is, you know, that feeling of um, wanting to take that suffering away from the puppy and replace it with happiness. It's a natural feeling that we already have. Um, and, you know, the love between that new mom and the puppy, you know, that's also natural to us. So we already have this to a certain extent, but the problem is it's not um, firm ground that we can stand on. It's not always there for us. And sometimes instead, you know, we feel like striking out at somebody because, you know, we're mad at them about something or uh, we've forgotten all about it and we just ignore uh, somebody's suffering. So um, that's why we practice aspirational bodhicitta. And then um, when we get up off the cushion and feel moved to do something to help others, whether it's just the people around us, um, people out there in the world who are suffering from the, you know, all kinds of things, as we know. Um, and it isn't one versus the other. I mean, you can do all of it, right? His Holiness um, you know, practices this with just anybody he comes in contact with. At the same time, he's also practicing it on a global level. And that's uh, a wonderful example from His Holiness, who is 
um, they say like the manifestation of Chen Rezi, who is the uh, the Buddha of compassion, the um, uh, Bodhisattva of compassion. So, um, you know, and I've, I've seen him in action and he really is so moving in that way. He's just living it. And it's like a sun giving rays in all directions. You know, it doesn't have to like think about it or anything. It just naturally happens. Um, but of course, he's done a whole lot of practice for many lifetimes. <laughs> So um, that's an example of what we can achieve. And uh, in this country, uh, some kind of a weird division between um, people who meditate and people who are activists and you know do stuff in community in the community. And um, that's a dichotomy that isn't really, I, I don't think it was there for the Buddha. <laughs> um, because he talked about aspirational and engaged bodhicitta, and they both support each other, as we've been discussing. Uh, actually, I want to mention that uh, Tuku Sangak Rinpoche, who is the spiritual director of the Nam Chok Foundation and uh, is the head of the entire uh, Nam Chok lineage throughout the world. Uh, in a talk he gave, I remember him saying that it's like, um, you know, when we go out and actually um, practice uh, bodhicitta in our actions um, with people, then um, that, you know, really um, gets it going strongly and manifesting it so that, uh, so karma means action. That's literally what the term means, the translation of the word. And so um, our windshields are kind of dirty from karma. And so we have trouble seeing reality as it really is. So when we go out and do these virtuous actions, acting from bodhicitta, then when we come back to sit on the cushion, our windshield is a little bit cleaner and we're able to see reality more as it really is. And so then when we get up off the cushion and go out into the world, seeing reality more as it really is, as you can imagine, our engaged bodhicitta improves, which then improves the um, aspirational bodhicitta, and so it goes. And so that's another virtuous cycle that Rinpoche talked about. I wanted to be sure and add that. Um, and then a question that somebody had about engaged bodhicitta was, I want to be of help, be of service, but I don't know what is mine to do. This is a huge question. And something that I've been um, especially interested in, actually. The thing about us waves is that no two are the same. Every single wave is unique. And so each of us has a very particular calling as actually probably more than one calling in our lifetimes, right? Uh, so special things that we can bring, our voice can come into the world in a particular way. Um, and if we don't do it, then it's not going to be done in quite the same way by anybody else. So um, then the question is, okay, well, what is that? Um, so I have a couple of ideas about how you can, um, you know, tune into what that might be. One is through shamatha, also known as calm, calm abiding. Because if you want to, you know, sit and look to the bottom of a pond and see clearly to the bottom of the pond and what it's made of and everything, you need to quiet the ripples and let the silt settle. And that's what shamatha can do. So um, we're very lucky that uh, Namchak Ken Rinpoche is an amazing really special teacher of shamatha and deeply practiced and accomplished in it. And so um, uh, he teaches that, and I highly recommend that you take that. But for the meanwhile, we do have the online course that I teach, um, and it includes shamatha so that you can just get started. And it includes not only shamatha, but um, Dong Lin, which is one of the four immeasurables of aspirational bodhicitta. And then you can do those 
uh, in a cycle call, which I call round robin. Um, because with shamatha, you see how we're not separate. You see how reality is. With uh, any of the four immeasurables like Dong Lin, you can feel how we're not separate. And we, you can feel how uh, the reality of that. So um, it, I can recommend those practices. But then uh, there's another uh, method that I want to mention. <clears throat> this one is essential. And then uh, you'll have more capacity to do the next one. Um, so here's the next question. There's so much suffering in the world. Where do I begin? So you can see that that's a similar question. Um, so here I would uh, say another method is to begin with looking at what's right in front of you, but maybe with new eyes. You know, Zen people talk about beginner's mind. So, you know, a lot of times we can't really see what's right in front of us because we're just so used to it. Um, so being able to look at it from a different angle or something so that in, in, in bringing this question in particular. So what have I been wanting to do? What have I been doing already that could be expanded? Um, what need am I seeing that, you know, is sort of running across my screen regularly in my life? And so might I want to address that? Um, but then there's, um, you know, looking way back in time to early in your life when you were um, a young child. And I imagine that there were challenges. And it, there's probably one or two that really stick out for you as kind of the big um, features, uh, you know, the big feature challenges of your childhood. And so if you do believe in karma and reincarnation, then, uh, I mean, that is the Buddhist view. And so the Buddhist view would be, <laughs> okay, um, I didn't, you know, just come to this life randomly, uh, but from past actions, you know, this is where my soul has carried itself. And so this challenge is not accidental or random but it's something to do with me personally. And if you look at your biography, you might notice, okay, I started out with this challenge. And if I look at what was my redemption story as I suffered this thing and then went forward in my life, it, it gets very interesting. What is the redemption story? Um, that I embarked on because of this painful, whatever it was, that was happening to me. Um, and so what can happen is, and I just want to say this is a little warning, <laughs> you may have found, okay, you know, I it set me on this path. Maybe it was somebody you uh, had a relationship with who was like one of your parents and, you know, actually brought some challenges to you that were familiar, or you may have found in your work something that feels familiar and not always in a good way. Sometimes it's really uncomfortable. It's like, oh God, not this again, you know? And so, you know, we aren't just going to go off in some different direction totally Again, there isn't randomness going on. Now we're embarked on a redemption story. So we're probably going to find situations that do feel familiar somehow. It's that we're hoping to make a different outcome. And this is the key. So that's what you can look for uh, historically as you look at the arc of your life. And then looking forward, where do I want my life to go? How would I like this redemption story? to go. I would say, first of all, um, something that I often say about meditation, it's like taking a mini vacation every day. Because 
you're not supposed to think about the normal things in life. You're not supposed to do all the productive things. You're supposed to, well, you're supposed to just sit there. So there's a famous book on uh, meditation retreat called Don't Just Do Something, Sit There. That's a real book title. And it's actually a good book on retreat. <laughs> um, so that's what you get to do every day um, for at least a few minutes, depending on how long your ses sessions are. And so instead, you're able to you know, sit in this vast ocean of awareness, whether it's shamatha or uh, practicing one or more of the four measurables um, or uh, the round robin where you do both you know you go uh, around between uh, shamatha and dong lin usually but it can be any of the four measurables so um, during that time while you're basically using these as uh, different avenues to get to the point where you're just sitting in that ocean of awareness expanding to the whole ocean instead of being this hardworking, busy wave, chasing after the things you want, running from the things you don't want, you know, all day in your dreams at night. Very exhausting to think that we've been doing that for countless lifetimes. Instead, we can take a break from all that and really just sit there and be. And actually, that's the most lovely place of all. Um, so uh, that's um, how you can help yourself uh, to keep from uh, burning out. But then there are lots of practical ways, it, you know, the Sabbath, for example. Um, that's actually a thing that we could still be doing. Uh, I, I instituted it many years ago because I realized I needed that time to clear my head. And then I was actually much more productive when I came back to my work, uh, when I just stepped out of the usual grind. Uh, so that's important. The other thing is what I had suggested about um, the semi-permeable membrane, the, the bubble around you, because some of burnout can be um, from just overexposure, you know, that we have too much incoming. Um, so depending on what you do for your work, that can be an aspect of it. Um, and remembering that we can't just breathe out, we have to breathe in also. So there does have to be rest. So breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, breathing in. Um, and remembering the two purposes, enlightenment for self and others, because we're also a sentient being. So those are some things that I keep in mind to keep from burning out. Um, I hope some of that was helpful. Once again, coming into um, kind of a group uh, quiet space together to dedicate the effort that we all put in, uh, in our busy lives to come together and think about these things together, contemplate them together, discuss them together. So we'll take a moment, drop in again, make a, a sigh. and savor this space together. Again, we have connected on uh, a deeper level than the um, internet. And that connection really exists because there really is that great ocean of awareness out of which we all come and out of which we are made. and savoring our togetherness for another moment. And then dedicating the positive merit of these efforts that we spent here tonight in 
considering ways that we can be of benefit to our fellow waves and in supporting each other in these explorations and in what we'll do in the future as a result of these contemplations. And we send out our aspirations that all of our fellow waves on the ocean, all beings, will eventually just live always from the place of the entire ocean. This is what we want for ourselves and for everyone. We want for all of us to wake up to the true reality of that. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for coming.